Hi, welcome to Quiet Connection, a podcast dedicated to ending the stigma around postpartum mental health. I'm Chelsea. In this episode, we get a unique perspective from Rachel, who not only has her own experiences with postpartum anxiety and depression, but also works closely with families struggling with mental health disorders. Let's hear from Rachel. Hey, so today I'm talking to Rachel. Hi, Rachel. Hey. How are you? I'm doing good today. That's great. Well, thanks How are you? for I'm I am doing okay. It's a mom day and I'm very tired. Hashtag mom life. Yes. I'm, I'm feeling <laughs> tired too. Um, I think the time change and this time of year is tough for me. Yeah, it's the same. Same for me too. Well, let's just jump right into it. You want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. My name's Rachel. Um, I'm a mother of one. She's 21 now, which is, which is crazy. crazy. Yes. <laughs> but I, you know, I did struggle um, with the end of my pregnancy with her and um, that those postpartum times. So um, I thought it'd be neat to to tell my story. But yeah, I, um, I, you know, I'm not originally from Vermont. I'm originally from Pennsylvania, and I moved around a bunch growing up. And uh, landed here in Vermont when I was in my 20s and just kind of stuck around. <laughs> <laughs> I moved away a couple different times, uh, Massachusetts and North Carolina, just for little blurbs for the boyfriend, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, those things shift and change. But, yeah, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm happy here in Vermont and uh, my daughter is doing pretty good and I'm super proud of her and she struggles with anxiety. So it's it's interesting with someone who has some little bit of anxious um tendencies supporting somebody else who <laughs> is anxious <laughs> when you're when they're anxious you feed off of each other and uh, it's a little nutty but yeah you, know, you just use your tools, right? Use your tools, use your toolbox. What were you like before you became a parent? I'm pretty outgoing and social. I I like to uh, do things, have people over. I would have these just, I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) I have, I'm a middle daughter of three and I'm definitely the typical middle child um, (laughs) where, you know, I try to make it, help everyone get along and smooth things over when they're rough and, you know, all those typical middle child things. Um, so I did a lot of things with my sisters um, and uh, my mother, challenging relationship with her. Uh, many mother, mother-daughter mother relationships can be challenging, but de- definitely challenging. But, you know, there's tough times and easier times, but uh, it's easier lately. So that's good. Yeah, that's good. What do you like about being a mom? I think it's I'm always learning. Like I, I keep telling people that I that I work with and that I'm friends with that, you know, although my child is 21 and you think parenting is really done, it's not. And I'm continuing to practice being that that parent I want to be like, what parent do I want to be and what feels good? And um, whenever something doesn't feel good, I'm like, how would I do that differently? Like that I, I call it the parent fail moment or the mom fail moment. Like <laughs> I didn't handle that well. <laughs> and, and I'm pretty open about how oh, that sucked. I, you know, and I, I, I do enjoy watching children grow, especially my daughter. And when she's learning new things, like she's just got a part-time job and she's going to school part-time and she hasn't quite got her license yet. So, you know, it's just kind of like balancing the whole, come on, get your license to how can I help you? And should we practice and, you know, <laughs> mm-hmm. supporting, supporting, but you know, it's that the expectations always get in your way though. It's, you know, you have these expectations or, or hopes for your child and the natural next steps. Okay. Next you'll do this and next you'll do this. And when they don't do it, you're like, Oh, Okay maybe next they don't do that (laughs) like get a job and get your license and you know go to school and all that but it's been pretty neat watching her grow into an adult and and uh you definitely hear certain things about 
you know, certain traits about yourself that come out in your child. And sometimes it's good. And sometimes it's, oh man, <laughs> what did I do? <laughs> Things for me to look forward to. Yeah. Um, so your daughter's 21 now, so we're going to have to go back in time a little bit. Mm-hmm. But what were those first few days like when you, when you brought her home from the hospital and, and were just kind of thrown into mom in it? Yeah, it was really, I think the biggest challenge was breastfeeding. Just that whole trying to breastfeed, learning the right latch and support around that. And I did have a home health nurse, which was lovely. And she was super supportive. And she, we got that started. But the first couple of days, I just didn't feel like I was producing enough milk and, nur- you know, nur- nourishing my child enough. And was she getting enough? And, and, you know, the whole schedules of, you know, really not sleeping, <laughs> you know, na- nap when your child naps, but, you know, you're, you're also thinking about all those things that need to get done, the dishes and, you know, cleaning up and I should probably shower and you know, <laughs> all those things. So it, you know, it was a little, at first it was okay, but as time went and the anxieties around is my child getting enough nourishment really kind of resonated just it it really started to weigh me down probably into a week of that that was going to be my next question yeah. when did you start when did you start to notice that things might be trending towards uh, i'm not feeling so great yeah yeah it was probably like a week into it so it was okay yeah. i had some support um my uh partner which was not my husband at the time but we did later marry he was supportive kind of like a typical dad, you know, I don't know what to do. (laughs) Like, how can I help? I'm not sure what to do. And, you know, he just allowed me to nap and which I didn't always use productively. You know, sometimes it was crying. (laughs) Yeah. Sometimes you need to do that. Sometimes the crying is, is more soothing than the nap is. Yeah, definitely. Um, so you had mentioned feelings of depression Mm -hmm. Um, It also sounds like you were having some pretty big feelings of anxiety. Did you notice these things in yourself becoming a bigger problem or was some, did it take somebody else having to bring it to your attention for you to really be like, um, something's up here? Um, probably a little bit of both. Like I definitely noticed it in myself. And then, uh, my partner just was like, what's going on? And, you know, and just kind of chopped it up to the baby blues. And, you know, it mm. definitely was like he mentioning it. And I just was like, I just don't, don't know how to like move forward. And I would call my home health person. I even called like the person on call. And that was the worst person, whoever they hired. I don't remember her name. She was not very helpful and supportive because I was like, I'm really worried that my child's not getting enough milk. Like, can I kind of supplement and get some formula and do breast milk and formula. You know, what, what can I do here? And she was just really cold about it. She's, well, if you made a commitment to breastfeed, then you need to follow through. Right. (laughs) Oh my gosh. You're shaking your head and I'm like, I know. Uh, Yeah. It's just super tough. So I let the, my home health person who came to visit me know that that's what her response was. And she's like, oh, that's, that's not helpful. I'm so sorry that happened. And, you know, if you really feel like she's not getting enough, you know, definitely give her some formula, see how that goes, but pump, you know, give her formula and pump and then see how much you're producing. Cause I really had a hard time pumping too, because I was so busy trying to keep up with feeding her that like, is she getting enough? And then, you know, I'm like just trying to balance the pumping and the feeding was nutty. Did she have weight gain issues when she was really little? Um, I wouldn't say, I mean, she was gaining weight, but she was still pretty skinny. Okay. She was little. Yeah. She was she a little was, peanut. Yeah. She wasn't even seven, seven pounds when she was born. And she did oh the gosh. natural lose weight at first and then she gained. And the doctors kept an eye on it. And we went to our appointments and, you know, they're like, no, she's fine, Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> Reassuring you. Yep. Which is good. Yep. Did you take any steps to sort of address other than reaching out to your home health provider? Like, um, did you talk to your doctors at all or or follow up nope. like that? No. No, I think it was mainly all about my concerns around the 
the feeding. And once that, um, I, I felt okay about that, you know, or just told myself, okay, I, I don't need to be doing this extra worrying I kind of moved beyond that. Um, but I would say I did, it's interesting because I, I was diagnosed when my daughter was very young in her toddler years with hyperthyroidism. Okay. So, and they did say that that kind of um, follows uh, hormonal phases. So after having a child um, would fit into that. So, and there, there's definitely, I don't know if you know anything about hyperthyroidism. Um, I'm, I'm hypo now. It, it flopped because of menopause. Menopause is lovely. <laughs> Fun. We'll, we'll, we'll have another podcast about menopause. <laughs> um, <laughs> so with the hormone, hormonal changes with the hyperthyroidism, you know, it, you have heart palpitations. There is some anxiousness, some revved up feelings. So, you know, there was definitely things. I've always been kind of active all through high school. Um, I played some sort of sport. Um, younger years, I figure skated, did a lot of sports. Wasn't particularly amazing or anything, but pretty good at most. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it was just noticing my body and that anxious revved up feeling that with the the thyroid thing, that's when I really noticed, all right, you know, years, this couple of years now that I've been not feeling so great and just kind of living with it. And I would talk to um, doctors about, you know, different things, but I'm able, I don't know, there's something in me that's just like, all right, brush off, move on. I didn't feel like I, I was needing anything extra su to support with that. Yeah, there was a time where I was, I did try some antidepressants um, because I was feeling extra and I think my child was around five then. So this was still a couple of years after the hyperthyroidism came into play. So just kind of like a jumps here and there and noticing different things and, you know, how much can you balance? Yeah. And that's something that they check for. Um, so similarly, when you go in for your six to eight week postpartum visit, if you're experiencing those symptoms of anxiety, they'll check for hyperthyroidism because it can really have a lot of the same symptoms mm -hmm. with it. Like you said, with the heart palpitations and the, and sometimes feeling nauseous and sweaty and dizzy and anxious. And so that's interesting that you found out later that yeah. that might've been contributing mm -hmm. to that. Another piece that might be interesting is during my pregnancy, I had preeclampsia. Mm, so you had some trauma. Yep. So you know, that's definitely, I think that played a big piece in the whole being, feeling like I was able to take care of my child well enough, not just feeding her, but taking care of her. And that preeclampsia was like, oh, bed rest. And still, you know, when you're pregnant, you're taking care of your child. So mm -hmm. what was most helpful to you? You said, you said you kind of just pushed through it, but like, did you have any, any sort of supports people, things that helped? I don't, or, or did you really just pull yourself up by your bootstraps and, and push through? I definitely felt like I could talk to a couple people about it, like my mother or the home health nurse and um, the family doctor about, you know, the things I was experiencing. And, you know, they reassured me that some of the things, some of the things that I was worried about were, you know, pretty normal things to worry about, but that my child was fine and that she was gaining weight. And, and, you know, I went back to work and I went back to work at a childcare center where my child attended with me. So I probably wouldn't have done as well <laughs> if she wasn't with me and I was able to nurse her whenever she needed to be nursed and, you know, just spend time with her whenever I could, you know, break times or what have you. So, and the support system of where I worked was pretty great. And that center is no longer open anymore, but it's just a child care center where, you know, we're all supporting one another. So, you know, employers, is they were super supportive. So probably couldn't have done it without them. Yeah, that's really, really helpful and important to have to have that kind of support in the workplace. Mm -hmm. So for listeners who don't know, um, Rachel and I worked together many years ago in a child care center. What kind of advice would you give parents when you would notice 
them maybe experiencing a little bit, maybe it was a little bit more of burnout because you were a very, very amazing and kind and empathetic teacher in the toddler room. Mm, thank you. And I know that you had great relationships with the parents that you worked with. And I know that some of our parents had experienced some tough times. What kind of things would you tell them when you started to notice that they were struggling? That's really interesting that you asked that because that's kind of what drove me to go back to school when I was noticing so much of the struggles that the parents were were going through, mental health and substance use and all that stuff. What kinds of advice would I give them? I think, you know, back then I probably wouldn't have known all the things I know now working and um, kind of dabbling in the mental health field and support services. You know, I definitely would keep talking with them and allow them that safe space to talk about what is going on in their world, what kind of things are they struggling with, and encourage them to talk with, if they have a counselor, um, talk with their counselor. If they don't, talk to their primary care provider, their doctor. And if if it looked like they were really struggling, I would encourage them to get a counselor. I support Um, counseling in so many ways, you know, it's, I've had a counselor and just having someone to talk to about things, you know, it's interesting because there are times when I have found that people just start talking to me. I I must feel like a (laughs) safe person to talk to. You do feel like a (laughs) safe person to talk to. So, you know, that whole not judging them and, and, you know, it's, it's easy to say, oh, I've been there, but, you know, we're all been there in different ways. So yes. Yeah. I like to say, um, in a lot of situations, but especially as new moms that we're all in the same storm, but we're in different boats. Yep. In the job that you're in now, do you notice a lot of the families that you're working with struggling with mental health disorders? Yes. Yes. Does that (laughs) seem to be the main clientele? Yes. (laughs) So it is not an uncommon thing. Not at all. Yeah. No. And it and do you do you notice that it's hard for mom or even dad to admit that maybe there's a mental health issue going on? That's a good question. I think most of the families that I work with right now, the, the parents are um, either in counseling and they recognize their mental health struggles or they're they know they need to find a counselor and my job would be to connect them and support them with their their search. So I think that's what has been hardest um, for a lot of the families that I've been talking to is taking that step to ask for help, mm-hmm. which it sound, it's, it's great that the population that you're working with, and maybe it's just because of the nature of your job, but that that they are seeking help. But I think it's hard for a lot of people to take that step to admit like, something's not right Mm -hmm. and and I need support I can't do this on my own yeah I think the stigma of mental health has has gotten better it's funny because the for school I we did a big group project was part of our graduate program and um the my group it's tough doing group projects but our group did uh the topic of the stigma of mental health and trauma and how trauma relates to that and i think these families so many people this these generations now have experienced trauma and i feel like trauma plays a big part in the stigma of mental health because we're definitely we talk about mental health and the stigma of it has, you know, it's not as big of a deal as before, not so hush hush or, um, you know, people don't, families don't talk about it. More families are talking about it and schools are talking about it and commercials talk about it. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's all over. It's, it's becoming less of a, a big deal, um, l- more comfortable for people to talk about it. So, and I think trauma is a big piece. Like, you know, we, we've all experienced some level of trauma and, you know, that kind of gets, we get in the way of our own selves when it comes to that. Like, uh, I don't want to do that because fear of what people will think and judge judgment and so forth. Do you think that fear is compounded as a parent? Oh yeah. 
Yeah. Definitely. Um, so the exposure seems to be getting a little bit better. Do you feel like the resources specifically for maternal mental health are are adequate where we are right now? Oh, um, no. <laughs> resources <laughs> for anything is is not adequate. And, you know, it's it's interesting because you hear about certain things that were available um, back in the 90s or, or before that. And it's just, you know, budgets being cut and you know, now after the pandemic or we're still in the pandemic, but since uh, shut down and, you know, people lost jobs or shifted out of jobs or, you know, the workforce is, is low. Um, Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, it's, it's hard to find good therapists, good counseling. And sometimes it's, there's a lot that there's high turnover. Like you might get an intern and they're not going to be with the agency that long. So then you have to start over with your, your whole life story and building a relationship and trust with a new counselor. I think that's something that prevents a lot of people too from reaching out and maintaining um, supports with mental health. Would you ever talk to your, to your daughter about, those first few weeks, those first few months, how you felt, um, how scared you were, how nervous you were, how, how those thoughts of not nourishing her made you feel? Yeah. Um, I have, I don't know if I have yet, to be honest with you. I mean, she's 21, but I I think that, um, she wants to be a pediatric nurse. Wow. So, you know, that's something that I, I'm sure the topic will come up, especially after we've discussed it. Um, you know, with this podcast, um, it is something that I would feel comfortable talking to her about. Yeah. Especially, you know, with, with the whole, if she wants to be into the nursing field, you know, best ways to support parents and her knowing that this is something that could happen. And a lot of moms struggle with this. Yeah. That, and I think she would be a phenomenal pediatric nurse. I've Mm -hmm. seen her with kids too, for a long time. I, I still cannot believe that she's 21. Um, (laughs) That blows my mind. I cannot picture her as 21. So in in one of my other sessions, we were sort of talking about feeling like we may not have been ready to have our children when we had our children, but we've but it felt like the natural next step. And maybe that contributed to a lot of our anxieties. Did you feel really ready to be a mom? Was this like a decision that you made and you were super ready for this? So the, that's a good question. The pregnancy was not planned. And, okay. And uh, the f- first reaction from my partner when I told him I was pregnant was not the best, which was super tough. I would say that I was definitely feeling like I was ready and I wanted to have children. It was tough because my partner and I were, were having these discussions. Okay, you know, I want to be a mom. I was 30 when I got pregnant, 31 when I... Um, gave birth. And I was like, I'm ready. I want to have children. I've always wanted to be a mom. And, you know, I'm 30 now, like it's time. And yeah, like, I definitely felt like I was ready. And then when I've got, you know, got his reaction, he was like, no, I didn't want to have any more children. And I'm like, crap. (laughs) So, (laughs) so it took some time to work through that. And we talked and, you know, we, we got to the point where it was, it was okay. And it worked out fine. But it was definitely tough. Those like the beginning of the pregnancy was tough. And then we'd work through it and decided that we're going to be a couple and, you know, try our best at this. And, you know, I was, I did feel like I was ready, but you know, you, like I said, there's, there's times in the first, you know, couple of weeks where you're just trying to manage this and you knew like you don't sleep a lot and you hear it, but you don't really know it, know it to experience it. Right. Mm-hmm. What do you think your daughter's opinions on on having kids is? Do you know what her opinion is? She's um she has talked about wanting to. She, she I she's the the part of me that she's uh uh characteristic traits is the opinions about things mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and expressing them sometimes like oh they shouldn't be having children at such age or you know they're not in a place mm-hmm. that they should. I, you know I think and, and I've always talked about you know, you have children when you have children and you can't really wait for everything to fall into place because, you know, who really has it all together when they have children financially, Mm -hmm. emotionally, 
um, professionally. <laughs> you, know, you, <laughs> you just have children when when you have children. Yeah, I think she she does want to have children. I, I'm not sure if she knows when she thinks she'll be ready, but um, probably that whole natural um, how society looks at it. You get married, you you know start start having some sort of career development, and then but who knows? Who knows? It's just it's just been on my mind a little bit because it feels like. Even my generation, but especially especially her generation, are choosing more and more to not have kids. Mm-hmm. And it's a really, um, it's an interesting thought process for me because the generation after mine and, or I guess before mine and, and back and back and back, it was an expectation. You found a partner, you had a child, you mm-hmm. had a good job, or you stayed at home with your kid and that was just what you did. But now there's this whole shift and it's like, um, I kind of like not having that responsibility and less and less people are choosing to have kids. So I was just kind of curious. Yeah. It's interesting being a parent of a child who is, you know, talking about having children or not having children, um, especially now with the um, raised awareness of the LBGTQ plus, you know, she, she, my daughter identifies somewhere in that realm. And, and me, I'm just like, Oh no, what does this mean? Am am I going to be able to be a grandparent? And you, and Mm. I can't like put that upon her, but I'm like, so do you think you want to have kids? (laughs) Am I going to be able to be a grandparent? And, um, you know, she, she says yes. And, you know, we talk about, you know, science and supports all around that and how to help that happen. But, you know, it's tricky. No, that's a really good conversation to have with her, though. Yeah. That's awesome. I'm, I'm glad that you have the relationship with her, that you can have that yeah, conversation. Definitely. I yeah. definitely cherish my relationship with her. You guys have always been super close. Yeah. I've got a question for you. Do you feel like there's many people ha- that have expressed or shared that they struggled with anxiety or depression prior to pregnancy and then they continue on? Like, is this a lifelong or? Um, so from the people that I've talked to for the podcast, there have been some people who were sort of predispositioned and I'll be transparent. I was predispositioned. So I, right. I have always had, anxiety and depression. And so it was much more likely that I was going to develop a postpartum mental health disorder. Right. In terms of specifically the postpartum mental health disorder continuing on and on and on, my understanding is that if it's left untreated, these things can become like just sure. part of your life. Mm-hmm. Um, but with treatment, what my doctors were telling me was I would get back to baseline, my baseline, and my baseline may even improve. So like my general anxiety, I may be able to tolerate more than I was before because of the heightened level of anxiety that I had with the postpartum anxiety and the postpartum OCD. As of right now, and I'm not a medical expert or anything, it sounds like postpartum mental health is completely treatable and will go away. But if you are predispositioned to mental health disorders, that's something that you likely will be living with for your life. Right. These mental health disorders can develop in pregnancy, too. Mm-hmm. So um, you could have gone your whole life and not be an anxious person or, or not be a depressed person and develop these symptoms in your pregnancy. And so I kind of use these terms interchangeably, but they're not really interchangeable. There's perinatal mental health, and that sort of encompasses the whole spectrum. And then there's postpartum, and postpartum is after birth. But perinatal mood disorders and mental health disorders are, again, completely treatable. Mm -hmm. And you can get treatment while you're pregnant, and you can continue treatment after you're pregnant. Using the disclaimer again that I am not a medical professional. <laughs> These are just things that I've learned through my experiences with mental health. 
but yeah, the the thing that I'm trying to drive home, especially with people telling these stories, is that there is another side. There is another side and you can get to the other side. Right. And everyone that I've been talking to has gotten to the other side. And that's so important to know. And the destination, there is no set point. It's not like a lot of people talk about the magic six month mark and like, oh, at six months, your hormones are going to level out. You're going to feel so much better. It's baloney. Um, <laughs> for, <laughs> for some people, that's true. But for other people, that is absolutely not true. And that's okay. But we have to hear it from each other that it's okay to feel the things that we felt and we won't, we won't feel them forever. Right. Yeah. Yep. That's so true. And for you, luckily, you soldiered through and you fed mm -hmm. your baby and <laughs> she was healthy and and you got through it. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Rachel. It was really interesting to get your perspective as a professional and as a parent. And um, I just appreciate you sharing your story with us. Absolutely. Thanks again for inviting me and hopefully we'll spread the word and help people through this tough time. Thanks again to Rachel for joining us and sharing her story. If you'd like to follow along with us on Quiet Connection, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok at Quiet Connection or at Quiet Connection Podcast. You can find us on all your major podcast platforms like Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, Amazon, iTunes, and more. Join us next time where another story is told and you realize you are not alone. I see you.